The Play is the Thing with your host, Judy Sleed. Today's guests, Pauline Sutcliffe from Stuart Sutcliffe Estate and Diane Vitali from Vital One Consulting Incorporated. One has a Hungarian accent, one has an English accent. Find out who now. Hello once again for The Play is the Thing, and I have Pauline and Diane, lovely ladies. <laughs> Thank you for having us again. Thanks for coming, and you were on my show a couple of years ago, and I'm just so anxious to find out what happened since then. Mm. Well, how long ago was that? Oh, uh, two years maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, I've grown since then, since then. <laughs> I'm taller. <laughs> you, look good. you look good. I'm certainly wider. Yeah. <laughs> Not wiser, wider. <laughs> and you, Diane? Everything is good. Uh, we've been very, very busy, uh, as usual. And uh, I think the last time we were on your show, we had just finished the In Conversation with Stuart Sutcliffe book. Right. Yeah, Stuart Sutcliffe from the famous Beatles. Yes. And Pauline is a sister of Stuart. That's right. And you are uh, in work, charge of his estate. I work with him. I am, and Diane works with the estate as well, oh, okay. as well as having her own professional consultancy practice, but she, she's, she works for the estate on the side. At this point, it's on the side. Yeah. It used to be a lot more. <laughs> we've, uh, we've made some uh, uh, real inroads into you know, what's going on in the Hamptons, um, and it's been very exciting. Yeah, I'm all excited to hear about it. Uh, well, well, you know uh, you might want to introduce the idea of the big show that opened mm. last year. Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, we did, in fact, finally published the book that we trailed on your show two years ago, at which yeah. time it hadn't actually, uh, the full book wasn't in print oh, when we really? were on your show. Oh, right, right. It was about to be published. And so we just had dummies of the, the covers and so on and some of the inside stuff. I thought you gave me a book like that. We, no. That was a little bit later. We, oh. we gave you one when we had a little launch party. Oh. And we signed a book for you. Yes. But anyway. It's at that, the library, I think, was it? Well, whenever it was. But mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's what happened with that. Um, okay, can but you hold yeah, that your up viewers so might up. be interested in seeing this. We, um, can I just go to those earlier. This now? is uh, obviously a, a, this picture, is a of picture of Stuart, Stuart early can, on. Uh, can you get a close up like that? If you could maybe hold it up a little. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Yes. And this is uh, actually in his sculpting class, I believe, right? Right, at the Hamburg Art School. And the, uh, your, your directors out there were especially interested in looking at some of the photographs. I could just go back here, and this is oh, right. a pretty famous one. Many have seen before. You want to say who's, uh, what this is? Now, Judy, I'm not going to challenge you oh. by asking you who they are. I well, could. I think the Beatles. Uh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> very good. The famous Beatles. The right. early Beatles, right? The very early yeah. ones. Okay. And that photograph was taken by Stuart's fiancée, Astrid, uh, who did many of the iconic Beatle photographs. Yeah, so, so do, you, do you know the names of those? Uh, never seen them before in my whole life. Oh. <laughs> you only never. had tea with them every Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> you want to or say a bottle who they of are? beer. Um, well, this is, of course, my late brother, Stuart. Yeah. That is the very young. And I tell you, in those days, he was very handsome, Paul McCartney. Uh -huh. That is in there. You can't see him properly. Yeah. That's the very very roguish looking John Lennon. Yeah. This is the enigmatic George Harrison. Uh -huh. And this was the original drummer before Ringo. And that's Pete Best, uh -huh. who was actually a very good drummer. Um, and he's, he's still around. He has a touring band. And 
does quite yeah. well, I believe. Yeah, he's he? doing very so well. So that picture is worth a thousand words. It is. <laughs> it is. Absolutely. It it's is. one of the iconic ones, isn't it? Yes. What's really cool about this is that Stuart, today, this, I mean, this person could walk down Madison Avenue and you'd think it was 2014, wouldn't you? Yes. It's very interesting. I think particularly the ones with him in the leather suit, aren't they? Don't you have some of those? Yeah, I do. You um, know, it's a really funny story, if I might share with you. Yes. You know, I teach at the Fashion Institute of Technology. No, I didn't know yes. that. See, see, this is a pretty cool, cool. picture of him as well. Uh-huh. And uh, I had given my students an assignment uh. to, uh, to go into the uh, fashion district and into the uh, you know Madison Avenue f retail district and to give an analysis of what they observed in terms of consumer behavior because that's one of the courses that I teach and one of my students very innocently you know I had done a, a lecture on Stuart Sutcliffe in my class uh -huh. about the fashion that dictated the 60s uh -huh. The collarless suits and the black tight jeans and the, yeah. the yeah. black leather boots and the leather jacket sunglasses. and the sunglasses, the James Dean kind of look. And one of my students innocently <coughs> came in to my class and said, you'll never believe who I just saw shopping at Prada on Madison Avenue. Oh. And I, I said, who? She said, Stuart Sutcliffe. Oh my God! He was there, <laughs> <laughs> and and she she was serious. Yeah. I mean, look at that face. Yes. And it was hysterical because she was maybe nineteen years old. Uh -huh. Didn't know the story. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure her parents know the story. I mean, she and her knew the look. Know the she story. knew the look. The look. You but know, she her. she yeah. She and thought she, she had just seen him. And, and she was serious. Yeah. And it just speaks to the iconic cultural symbolism that Stuart represented and continues to represent, which is one of the reasons why he's a bit timeless in the fashion industry, that is. Uh-huh. And, and then following that, um, last year in the summer, we had this fantastic exhibition of Stuart's work uh, at Harper's Books and Gallery. Oh, at Harper's Books. I remember that's where you had the exhibition. Yes. Yes. You, you were there, weren't I you? I was there, yes. Right. And we were amazingly fortunate enough for Harper to um, bring Richard Prince on board, who wrote this amazingly wonderful essay on behalf of Stuart and oh, his work. It's very special. And which was more than special because, you know, Richard's probably one of the most important living artists in America. And he not only curated the show, but wrote this amazing essay about Stuart. Oh. And th this is another photograph of Stuart in his own studio. And bearing in mind, he died in 1962. And yet, again, Diane's reference to stylishness and uh, iconic looks uh, mm -hmm. are such that, that one could imagine that he actually was just working in the studio over there uh -huh. as we're speaking. Absolutely, yes? absolutely. And, uh, so this was an absolute trailblazer, wonderful work on show. Mm -hmm. um, very, very well received, mm -hmm. and that's a full image. If you open it up, you could see that that work this on paper is the cover. Is the cover if, if you if, open the if cover, you open up. it up and turn it around, mm -hmm. you could see that it's a. No, this like this. One? No, no, no. This way, darling. See that? Like that. Oh, like that. That's, that's yes. One oh, this is one yes. painting. Yes. yes, it's a Hamburg work on paper. Stuart loved to create, uh, he used mixed media on paper. Uh -huh. And he was very fond of, in his late works, 
and, and using, by the way, using this newspaper is, this clippings. This one says it's a self-portrait mm -hmm. of itself. Mm -hmm. Yes. This yeah. is wonderful, wonderful. So you have so many things to uh, talk about. And uh, what is it, uh, the main subject of, of your business? Well, uh, I have a management consultancy practice. And what we do is go into organizations and help them facilitate the change-making process. We also, um, so that's, that's one, of the, one of the divisions of what we do. And as you well know, Pauline is a psychotherapist who does executive coaching. So she works with the uh, executives at helping them to manage the change-making process. So that's, that's just a, a, the, uh, the, the corporate side of the work that we do together. Uh -huh. And um, Yet it's not all ex late beetles and yeah. early beetles. <laughs> and but, but I did want to say one more thing. Okay. I'll, I'll, can we go back there in a moment? Yes. I did want to say one more thing about Stuart's work and the fact that his late work was all created in Hamburg, Germany. And that is that um, uh, if you know Harper Levine, his wife Marianne, yes. Mariana Levine, uh, actually went to school in Germany and actually lived there for a number of years. And she speaks German. Uh huh. And she was able to look at a lot of the artifact collection. And she was able to identify, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the newspaper clippings and what they depicted and how they tied into the imagery of the work. And it really added so much more depth and meaning to why Stewart selected those clippings to put in his works on paper. So she was able to really dig a lot deeper into the profound meaning of the work. Mm -hmm. She also was able to go through the artifact collection, which she is representing, and uh, she's put together um, uh, a, a prospectus, a prospectus mm -hmm. of the artifact collection along with Harper. And it's just tremendous to read because it links all of the significant events that were happening in that moment, in those moments in time of Stuart's career and his life. Um, there are some interesting tidbits mm. about... Yeah, it, it, I mean, just to put it in context a mm -hmm. little bit more, um, in, in the 50s in Britain, uh, we were not yet recovered from the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And there was still a lot of uh, destruction uh, visible uh, from the from end the of the bombs. Second World War, from the bombings. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because uh, in the 50s, I mean, people hardly ever went abroad. I mean, if you were just from normal, ordinary families, unless you were rich. And so to go to Germany, when these boys all went to Germany to play as a band, they, they had some hesitation because of the memories of the war that they either, well, they were a little bit young to have the memory of it, but they knew from the people around them uh, what attitudes were like uh, towards Germans, uh, mm -hmm. which were in the main rather negative. Um, but another link that Mariana made when mm -hmm. she was doing pr the prospectus with Harper was that part of the artifacts are about uh, s s lecture notebooks. And some of the lecturers at Stuart's Art School in Liverpool before he went to Germany, some of them were German and they had been uh, blacklisted in Germany and couldn't get work but they'd been given a sanctuary in the Liverpool Art School and were some of the most important uh, artists of their day, living artists and brilliant lecturers. And so in the artifact collection, we, we have some wonderful lecture notes, uh, not just Stuart's annotations of them, but some of them were 
uh, direct reportage from these amazing men who were, you know, kicked out of Germany, you know. And teaching at the college. In Liverpool. Mm -hmm. And there's something serendipitous about, uh, did, and John was at the college, of course, remember, John Lennon. And so when the two of them, plus George and Paul at the time, they were in high school. No, high school? Yeah, it would be equivalent to high school, high school here in the States. Pre-college. Uh, when they end up in Germany with this heritage behind them, now and again, John used to uh, rebel against uh, the whole German thing and be really quite rude to the audiences, wouldn't he? Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's, that's a bit of a, uh, a context for you in why the uh, contribution from Mariana and from Harper has added such richness yes, to the prospectus um, on the artifact collection. Now we can go back to the professional work. Well, that's, <laughs> that's important, yes, uh, I, I yes. think, to mention, because they've done a fantastic job at putting that prospectus together, and we're very excited about it. We are indeed. Uh, yes. Uh, do you, have you ever heard of the um, Northeast Business and Economics Conference? I'm sorry to say I did not. Don't be sorry, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> just, be, just be grateful. <laughs> <laughs> be grateful. <laughs> no, teasing. <laughs> teasing. No, they're, they're, they're a terrific group. Uh, we've are. actually uh, had a few papers published by them. And uh, we've been asked to speak at their conferences over the years. Um, and uh, we are speaking again this year in November. Uh, at one of their at their annual conference, and our uh, our subject is the title of a book that we've been kind of sort of writing for a long time. But uh, you know, <laughs> we always get sidetracked. Pauline has business, I have business, yeah. and we always get sidetracked. But and, um, and forgive me for interrupting. Then we discover that somebody else has had the same idea and, <laughs> and written it better and published it, so we have to go back to the drawing board. Exactly. You know, we're forever yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. revising it, aren't we, Dan? Yeah. But, but anyway, but we're it's, uh, getting back to it again. Uh, and what's interesting is it, it sort of bridges what 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 change making is is happening at the corporate level, but it's also an academic group. So. Academia requires a very different approach from what would be the norm in uh, the practical application in an organization. You know, um, they, they, they are two different worlds, academia and the corporate world. But this organization sort of bridges the two. And there are a lot of uh, CEOs and executives going back to school to get their PhDs. And they are writing papers about their, you know, doctoral dissertation and presenting at this conference. So it's very, it's a very interesting, eclectic group of people. But but it is galvanized by the main theme of uh, business and economics. Mm -hmm. So this um, is for people who are going into business or corporations or are already to there. How to lead these companies? Yes, yeah. to lead them better in often. Yeah. Better, yeah, yes. because I would. Imagine that a lot of these big corporations are not doing well. Well, you know, I mean, they're not run well. That's what mm -hmm. I mean. Right. Mm -hmm. But you see, right. what I mean, we're having to to sort of research this quite a bit because, um, you know, with the the technology that's um, come into play now, and the you know the social network world yeah, and globalization. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's it's absolutely thrown a bomb in, into it, hasn't it? I it mean, has. it's, uh, you, it can't, has. you can't run fast enough, you know, to I, keep up with it, can you? No, you can't. The traditional linear model of how to run a business. I just had an experience, I mean, several times when I talked to these people on the phone, it seems it seems like I don't talk to a human being. They like <laughs> reading something. Everybody's uh -huh. reading it. Uh -huh. And you can't get to first base because they don't treat you as a person. Mm. Right. Mm. Mm. And that's mm. what it, you know, because mm. that's how they teach the right. the employees uh, not to teach them as individuals, but you know, 
yeah. as I wrote. And I, I tell them, I, tell, I feel like I'm talking to a machine. Yeah. You are often. Yeah. <laughs> well, now with voice activation, a lot exactly. of it is, in fact, talking it, it, to a machine. Yeah, well, I mean, it's voice, but I'm talking about uh, when you finally get to a person. Yes, yes. But still, they seem like they were really It's a rote, isn't it? It's yeah, a rote message. Yeah. It's, an interesting, yeah. it's an interesting thing because in the 90s, we were saying the slogan for my company in the 90s was service is the currency of the 90s. Oh. That, was the, that was the slogan, you know? And now that we're well into the 21st century, yeah. um, the buzz seems to be that relationships are the currency of the 21st century. Oh. And ironically, the technology that you're talking about yeah. is preventing that building of the relationship. It's preventing the interaction between yeah, human beings. Mm. And That's, it's muddied the waters yes. quite a bit, hasn't yeah, it? But it, was, it happened to be AT&T that I had problems with <laughs> yesterday. I talked to several of the technicians, and I said, it feels like I'm talking to a machine. And I couldn't get to a personal Basis right, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and yet there's all that um, commercial stuff on television about you know the talking bank, and oh, yeah. oh right, you know, what, which, which commercial is that? Is that TD Bank? Oh yeah, or, the TV yeah. bank. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, time to uh, bank normal. <laughs> right, right. You know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. What did you say? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's just. Yeah, yeah. It's very funny, but it's yeah. it's true. It's it technology true. has gotten in yeah. the way of us personalizing mm -hmm. and creating the intimacy that one needs to establish yeah. when developing relationships. I mean, that's we have relationships with whoever we pay for services yeah. and yeah. goods. Yeah, and I've been a oh, customer we used to. for many years, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they were just people were actually nasty. Mm. Yeah, mm. yeah. And you know, what you should do when you get a really nasty one. Because they vary. I will. I told them I'm going to write to the corporate headquarters. Just, I will. Just cut the call off. Wait a few hours. Ring again. Yeah. And you'll get somebody else. But similarly, <laughs> on the other side of that is when you get someone really good. Good. Occasionally uh, I, I you don't do. Think, I don't think people are praised enough for the kinds of services they do yeah. give when, they do, when they're doing good work. Um, and, and probably the lack of recognition, yeah. the lack of feeling valued in an organization is what prevents people from extending themselves and going the extra mile. People need to feel appreciated. Well, on that right. subject, and, and God, I'm really free associating to this <laughs> idea. <laughs> Only yesterday, I, I, the other day I received a, a letter from my health insurance saying that they wanted to remind me that there were some outreach things they could do for me, mm -hmm. um, you know, with, with a, a case nurse or something like that. Um, at no extra charge did I know that my health insurance mm -hmm. provided this service. So, and they'd been trying to get hold of me. And I thought, well, I haven't got any uh, answer phone messages from these people who've been trying to get hold of me. Mm -hmm. uh, but I decided I would call them up. Mm -hmm. And... They were enormously polite. It was, it was voice to voice. It wasn't a message. Um, and they'd play a nice piece of music and they'd tell me there's going to be a gap after the music before we put you through live to somebody else. Mm -hmm. I never did get to anybody else <laughs> in the end. It was a very long and song. Then, <laughs> and then, then, I mean, I thought this was the ultimate nerve. They asked me would I do a survey on how I'd oh, just yeah. been... <laughs> how you've just been serviced. serviced. Yeah. And then <laughs> I said, oh, okay. No. And then when they put me through, I couldn't hear them. <laughs> so that's when an attempt at is made. giving yes. service yeah. is really um, dismantled by the technology. Oh, when yeah. the technology yeah. doesn't work. No. And that's, you know, you can't replace people. No, no, you can't. And, you know, uh, that's part so, of the issue that organizations are dealing with. Say very quickly, could you just tell me about the play that's in L.A.? Oh, right. Just in a nutshell. We have very like little time. That? Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the play backbeat, as opposed to the, the film, the movie backbeat, um, uh, started off in two venues in Britain, including London, um, went to Canada, then went out to L.A., 
a uh, lot of rewriting we noticed in LA. Uh, mm -hmm. So obviously the director and producers were tweaking it for different audiences, would and, be my guess. And can you just pause for one yeah. moment? That's an example of needing to adapt to different cultures in order to communicate a message. And that relationship has to be based upon establishing the common ground. Right. Good. That's very good, good point. Yeah. Very yeah. good point. Yeah. So, are you so they did a lot of rewriting. To bring it to Broadway yes. eventually. Eventually. Um, uh -huh. It's going out to Europe now, further into Europe, not just in uh, Great Britain, which has never been regarded as Europe um, <laughs> until <laughs> fairly recently, you know, in the last 20, 30 years. Um, and so it's going to Hamburg. Uh, I think they may well um, franchise it and let countries do their own version of it to cover that point, probably, right. on language. Because it's indicative of the culture, and that's actually one of the subjects of the work that we did on one of our papers yes. with the economics conference about speaking the same language and understanding different currencies so that people can relate to the content. Mm -hmm. Well, it's So it's going, to be a, it's going to be a while before here. it gets to Broadway. <laughs> But it will. And the next time when you come, I hope we'll be able to say it's been on Broadway. I want to thank Lupita for doing my hair and all the people who contributed to allow me to do this show. And what about the nails? They, they're not polished today, do you? Oh, my nails, I'm sorry, it's not polished. I mean, they're beautifully manicured, but yes, they're just yes, not polished. Yes. <laughs> and I want to thank Lena and my son, Jeff and all the other people who worked on this show. And it's been so lovely having Pauline and Diane back. Mm -hmm. And we have to do it again because a lot more things we didn't we talk about. We have a about. lot to say. See, a half hour goes very, very fast. <laughs> Love me.